Hello and welcome to Azim Premji University's Nobel Explainers. Today we're going to be discussing the 2025 Physics Prize, which went to John Clark, John Martinez, and Michael Devore. And they won it for their discovery of macroscopic quantum mechanical tunneling and energy quantization in an electrical circuit. Now that was a lot of big words for me to memorize, but to make sure that none of you get scared away, I have with me physics professor Kripa Gauri Shankar, who teaches here at the university. Hi, Kripa. Hello. Nice to be here. <laughs> so, firstly, can you sort of break down these two big phrases, which is quantum tunneling and energy quantization? What are we talking about? Okay. So, I'll try my best to uh, explain these concepts. Um, so, what happens is... Uh, when you go to very small scales, as in when you go to the level of uh, subatomic particles or electrons, for example, uh, particles at that stage um, actually show a lot of wave-like characteristics. And you might have heard about this in several other contexts, like people might have mentioned this to you, that there is this uh, wave-particle duality, etc. But this wave-like nature is more pronounced at the small scales than it is at macroscopic scales. So what happens at those small scales is that um, quantum tunneling arises as a natural consequence of the wave-like nature of the particles. Um, so at those small scales, you can imagine what does a wave-like nature mean? The nature uh, sort of implies that the particle is not localized to a particular point in space, but rather sort of delocalized and spread out. That's one way of imagining it. So in such situations, uh, even if there is a potential barrier, like if there's a huge hill or something, um, then a particle can in principle uh, leak out to the other side of the hill. So this kind of a phenomenon doesn't happen for macroscopic particles. So if you take a tennis ball or something like that, then its wave-like nature is highly suppressed. If you look at its wave function, then it would have a very narrow extent. It doesn't uh, extend into space. Uh, so the quantum mechanical properties like this kind of tunneling, etc., which arise, arise simply out of the wave nature, they are also not seen in macroscopic particles. So this tunneling is referring to what you described, like potentially a hill being there and the particle being able to pass through that's, the barrier. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's what I mean. So it's if a particle doesn't have the energy, classically, if a particle doesn't have the energy, to uh, cross that barrier, if you don't give it enough energy, then there is no way that it would cross a barrier and maybe go from one part of the one side of the barrier to the other. However, because of this tunneling, there is a finite probability that the particle can leak into the other side. Mm -hmm. What about energy quantization? Energy quantization actually, um, well, it's a very easy thing to visualize. Uh, you imagine that you're looking at an electron inside an atom. It turns out that the electron can't have any energy, any value of energy. The values of energy that it is allowed to have are like uh, rungs of a ladder. So in some sense, it's like that. Although they are, the rungs are not equally spaced in the case of an electron in a hydrogen atom, uh, essentially they are separate levels. So you can't have electrons having any odd energy, but only specific values of energy. Yeah. This is broadly what is uh, energy quantization, but this idea leaks into no every other uh, quantum mechanical system as well, not just electrons in right. a single atom, but it could be electrons in a metal right. and, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, a particle in a harmonic well, yeah. so several other contexts as well. So what I understand is that the accomplishment of these three laureates was that they were able to demonstrate these two phenomena, which are usually observable only at a very small scale, at a atomic or even subatomic level. But they were able to demonstrate it in a um, visible larger scale in a system that's, I read, as big as the palm of our hand. So how were they able to do something like this? Okay. So the system is not as big as the palm of your hand. I think what they said was that you can hold it in the palm of your hand, but you shouldn't hold it in the palm of your hand because then the physics will all just break down. So you can't actually hold it. It's just the size is like that. 
So the core of all of this is actually superconductivity. So it turns out that there are some metals um, and if you cool these metals to a temperature below some critical temperature, uh, the electrons in the metals, they all pair up. They pair up and form what are called Cooper pairs. And uh, what we know about electrons is that they are fermions, which means that two electrons can't occupy the same state. But uh, once they pair up, they become bosons. Okay, so these are called Cooper pairs. And uh, Cooper from another Nobel Prize, which was again awarded to superconductivity, uh, was uh, of course the person coined, I suppose, the term. Uh, but now that they are bosons, they can all sort of occupy the same state. And uh, what this does is all of these Cooper pairs essentially form a coherent wave function. So you can imagine that now the entire superconductor is acting like a single unit in some sense. It's okay. acting like a single uh, system with separate energy. Right. Almost like one big atom? One like similar to one big okay. atom. Yeah. This is obviously really fascinating from just the point of view of understanding our universe, understanding the physical world. Mm -hmm. But I also heard the Nobel Committee call it enormously useful. So can we talk a little bit about how something like this could actually be useful to the general person? Yeah, but in order to explain that, I have to go back to your previous question. How did they make this possible? So one of the things, of course, is superconductivity. But there is this Nobel Prize is actually, uh, you know, there are several Nobel Prizes which precede this one, which have sort of paved the way for what has happened in this work. One of them is Josephson's Nobel Prize. So Josephson was this, I think, when he just graduated at a very young age or something, he predicted a particular effect. So what he said is that if you take two superconductors and uh, separate them by a thin insulating layer, then... Um, you know, in each of the sides of, uh, on either side of this insulating layer, you have two coherent wave functions, right? Uh, but uh, if these wave functions have a small phase difference between them, then that could lead to the tunneling of uh, Cooper pairs through the um, insulator. Okay. Okay. So if you have a phase difference, that leads to a Josephson current. And this is what is called the Josephson current. So the current, uh, not the, not the current current, but the this recent yeah. Nobel Prize uh, builds on this idea. Um, so using two Josephson junctions, you can create what is called a squid. So you can create a um, circuit, a, a, a loop, okay. uh, basically of two superconducting materials, but again, two insulating layers. So it's a loop, mm -hmm. right? And um, you know what is special about this loop is, even in the absence of any external voltage, there's going to be a, current flowing through the loop, okay. simply because of the phase difference between the wave functions in the superconductors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, basically it's a little circuit where there's some current constantly flowing, right? Um, and what quantum mechanics predicts in this system is that the current, you, this is a simplified uh, ex explanation of course, but you can imagine that the current either flows clockwise or anti-clockwise. So there are several phases and two of the phases are basically equal in energy. Mm -hmm. One is um, the current flowing clockwise and the other is the current flowing anti-clockwise. Mm -hmm. So what these folks did was using Josephson junctions and this in, thing which I told you about SQUID, which stands for Superconducting Quantum Interference Device. Okay. Um, <coughs> it's some, it's a basically a modified version of all of these things. It's a highly engineered um, circuit made up of several of such components mm -hmm. and they also took into account I've heard inductances and capacitances and all of that. Okay. So they essentially managed to create a circuit with a varying phase difference. Okay, okay? and uh, it turns out that um, in such a circuit you have several phases which are possible mm -hmm. but two of them have the same energy okay. like this anti-clockwise and clockwise. They are two degenerate states okay. with the same energy. That's, that means they have the same energy, okay. but obviously an anti-clockwise current is different from a clockwise current, okay. right? So um, you just leave the system alone mm -hmm. and you um, see after some time, you find that you know the 
current can either be anti clockwise or clockwise right. which means that the phase has tunneled from one value to another value i see so this is basically the entire quantum mechanical wave function functions phase mm -hmm. has tunneled through a barrier okay, okay. it's a lot of uh, abstractness but it's easy to understand it if you uh, think of uh, the phase as a particle right and the particle is tunneling through a potential okay right yeah. so the phase can have one value or another value right and in one value the current is going this way the other value current is doing something else yeah. Why is good, that good? Can this do? Okay, so because of this, because you have a two-state system, like you have two phases mm -hmm. essentially, and if you, you know, if you leave the system alone, unobserved, unperturbed, then uh, the state is basically a superposition of these two states, mm -hmm. right? Uh, this is exactly what quantum computing requires. They require the presence of qubits, okay, which are essentially two-state systems. Okay. And the state at any point is a superconduct. Uh, sorry, a superposition of the two uh, right. uh, states, and uh, you should be able to do calculations and finally make a measurement uh, on these qubits. Yeah, that is one thing, and also the fact that it is macroscopic uh -huh. makes it extremely useful. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, qubits are usually we think of light uh, polarization as possible candidates for qubits, or um, Uh, I mean, there are several candidates. Sure. Uh, so here, the advantage is that you can actually tune several parameters. Mm. You can apply an external magnetic flux and uh, sort of tune, um, you know, the uh, transition rates between one state and another. Okay. You can control the depth of the potential externally using again magnetic flux. So yeah, it's a highly tunable circuit which can provide qubits for you, and it's also macroscopic. but it's not extremely easy you have to go to very very low temperatures mm -hmm. and it has to be a very isolated system because any interaction of the system with the environment will uh, immediately collapse the state into one or the other phase mm -hmm. and it doesn't remain in a superposition right right so that's always the problem with uh, quantum computing okay. Awesome. So, thank you so much Kripa for helping us break this down and thank you all for watching another episode in the Azim Premji University Nobel Explainer series. Watch out for the other ones.